I'm Andrew Beatty for Wednesday, May 20th, and you're watching Bedtime Stories with the Motel or Cyclist. <laughs> Welcome back and thank you for watching another edition of Bedtime Stories with the Motella Cyclist. I'm really excited about tonight's show. Tonight I am very privileged to have had the opportunity to sit down with a very special guest, the first woman to have traveled around the world on a motorcycle. Anne-France Dauteville is my guest for tonight's show. Now you may not know Anne-France Dauteville, she uh, traveled the world in 1973 uh, she did it on a Kawasaki 125. We're going to hear more about her story, but she did something that's a little unique. She did it with a lot of poise and grace, uh, so much so that years later in 2016, she was rediscovered, so to speak, and by none other than the Chloe Fashion House in, pa in Paris to become the muse for her, their 2016 autumn collection. She's the author of J'ai suivi le vin, which is her chronicled story in French about her travels around the world. And Anne France will be my guest tonight, my very special guest for almost the entire show. I say almost the entire show because no episode of Bedtime Stories with the Motel or Cyclist would be complete unless I stopped in and, and had a conversation with Wes Fleming host of Chasing the Horizon for another Chasing the Horizon Moto Moment. Tonight, Wes and I will be talking about the tariffs in China and what that means for the helmets, motorcycle helmets coming out of China. So we'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned and my guest will be Anne-France Dauteville. I look forward to seeing you. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you for joining me again, and I am so delighted to have our to welcome our next guest, none other than the first woman to travel around the world on her motorcycle, Anne France Dauteville. Yes, here she is. Anne France, are you there? Yes, I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm so delighted. I mean, what a pleasure it is to to hear you and talk to you today. Uh, I'm so happy that you're able to call in and we were able to have have this quick discussion. En France, many in the world believe that uh, you were the, um, or didn't, are probably not aware that you were in fact the first woman to travel around the world. There are others who seem to get credit for it and I had to do a little bit of Google search to be able to find you. Tell me a little bit about the story on when you did it and how you got into motorcycling. Oh, I came into motorcycle in uh, 68 because, you know, we had that revolution in, in all over the world, especially in Paris. In that time, I was working uh, in, uh, as a copywriter in advert uh, creative copywriter in advertisement agencies and uh, there were no public transportation. And uh, I had to walk a lot to go from my flat to uh, the, the office. So when the revolution was over, uh, I bought myself a motorcycle because I had no car license, no motorcycle license, nothing. So the only thing I could buy would have been a bicycle, but no. Uh, and I bought myself a little 50cc Honda. Uh, that you could drive without any license. And I discovered something extraordinary. It is driving, driving, moving. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love it. Um, 
when when you got into uh so tell me the story about how so that's 68 72 so how inspired you to get into traveling the world then i went uh, higher and higher in my specialty uh made money etc etc and uh, i asked me the only question you should never ask it is how much do i pay my money <laughs> and uh, <laughs> problem is that uh, during 11 months of the year I was happy doing my job, having my life, etc. And the 12th month when I used to hop on my motorcycle because in, be between, in between I had got my license, I bought uh, better and better motorcycles and used uh, during the month of September to hop on my motorcycle and uh, travel around France, uh, etc. And I was perfectly happy. And I said, well, at the end of my life, when I die, I will have 11 parts of my life, which will be okay. And only one twelfth of my life, which is heaven. It is stupid. With the little time I have on this earth, I want to be on heaven all the time. So I said no goodbye for money, for success, uh, etc., etc. beautiful slaps. Got broke, but happy, and <laughs> toured the world. So, so your first trip it was in 1972. Now it wasn't the first trip wasn't around the world. You you took off from Paris and you joined a group of other motorcycles. And I guess that sort of gave you the inspiration, right? It was a rally, so it was organized by an organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We had to ride from Paris to Isfahan in Iran. And uh, I, there were 102 motorcyclists, and I was the only woman driving. There were women passengers, but the only woman driving. Um, I had a huge uh, 750 Moto Guzzi, uh, very powerful, which was lent to me by the importer in France. And I learned two things on that trip. First, I'm built to travel by myself. Second, <laughs> uh, when you travel by, with a motorcycle, uh, you must pick it by yourself when it falls down. <laughs> uh, when that motorcycle was leaning, I couldn't stop it from falling down. And uh, when it was uh, on the ground, I couldn't pick it up. <laughs> and uh, on the, at the end of their rally, I arrived to Isfahan. Eleven of the of the the, the, the the driver said we go to Afghanistan so I went with them five to Pakistan I went with them and on the way back I used to drive uh, in the morning start before the others and uh, go my way and we would meet uh, at the arrival so I found myself on the sand desert north of Iran and it is corrugated iron you know uh, mm. uh, a gravel road so you have to drive something like 80, 80, yes, 80, 90 kilometers an hour. And I drove quite well by myself and it was perfect. And suddenly there was a bulldust, you know, uh, loose sand. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put speed enough, fell down, boom. And the motorcycle was down and I was in a desert by myself. And nobody, of course, a desert. So I waited, sat on the motorcycle and arrived a truck, big truck, I stopped the truck and with my hands, I showed to the three big guys with a turban on the head, please uh, pick up the motorcycle, uh, etc. They saw that I am a woman. They shrieked, they really shrieked with anger, with fear, horrible, and jumped into the truck and <laughs> went away and I had to sit down on the motorcycle and wait for the others to arrive and help me. So <laughs> always pick up your motorcycle by yourself. <laughs> and those three men went away shrieking with fear because I think they decided that I was a, a demon, you know, that I was a, an effort, something like this. Well, they, they, something they weren't expecting to see a woman on a motorcycle, clearly. Um, it cannot exist, it, so it is a devil. <laughs> So you, you, you come back to Paris and, and, and your, your trip is over at this point. Then you decide, I need, so, I need to do something more. And you declare that you are going to go around. Well, first, two questions here. First, did you know that no other woman had actually gone around the world when you decided to make that, that declaration? 
No, and I even did not uh, ask me the question. Wow. So, so then my next que my question is, is that what inspired you to do this? Like, you, 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 you had realized in this short, in this short first phase that you wanted more of it. You wanted to live those other eleven months on on the cloud again, as you said. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you did, did you get out and declare that okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go travel around the world now and write a book. How did that happen? In fact, uh, I've been so happy writing the book, uh, being published, etc., etc. If I wanted to carry on this uh, way of life, I had to do something which is a dream for people, which is a very strong image, and which is a gorgeous trip. Something uh, really out of the way. So I didn't ask me if uh, as a woman I the first one is right. That was not a question. The question is, uh, I want to do something which will give me room in this world of big men, which was the motorcycle world. And and yet you chose a, a much smaller bike, one that <laughs> you didn't have to worry about, that you could pick up if it fell down. You chose a, ca a, a, a 125, did you not? Uh, it was written 125, but it meant uh, one cylinder, two stroke, five gears. <laughs> in reality, it was 100 cc. I would have known it was 100 cc. I don't know if I had dared to drive it around the world, including Afghanistan and the heavy roads over there. <laughs> what? So, so you, you, you traveled. Uh, how long did your journey take you around the world? Oh, four or five months. You know, I'm a wanderer. Uh, there is a girl uh, which is uh, who made a, a round the world trip uh, on motorcycle in the 80s. Uh, she is Elspeth Bird. Uh, she took three three years because she used to uh, go in a place, stop, work, fall in love, uh, break her heart, uh, go away again, etc. She that, that's quite different. I'm a wanderer. I love to go away. I love to see uh, what is a little bit further and uh, to come back home to my cats and uh, and, and, and write a book. Uh, if I stop somewhere, it will be with my friends with a good French wine bottle and uh, good stories, etc., etc. Uh, I'm not, um, how do you say? I'm very French. I'm very, very French. That's my place. But the world is a place for the human in me. Well, and, but you also did this, and, and forgive me, you did it with quite a bit of style. I'm pulling up, I'm showing the audience some pictures of you, um, and and I wanted to just bring them up so that they could see um, you doing this as a, you know, I love that famous saying that um, that they say is that uh, you know, Fred Astaire and uh, Ginger Rogers, well, Ginger Rogers was the, uh, was the better dancer because she did it backwards and in heels and I'm showing everybody a picture of you on your 125 in a beautiful sundress and you've got heels on on, to on top of that I think that was taken in and taken in Belgium if I'm if I'm not mistaken no, no, it, was, <laughs> it was the east of Paris uh, next to the the country house of my parents uh. but uh, that was in France when I was traveling I always had a French dress because if people invited me for dinner or anything Thing, uh, I, I owed to them to show them and to honor them with uh, being uh, clean, uh, elegant, etc., etc. It was a way to say thank you. And uh, but uh, those were photos for the promotion. And what's one? The dress. Uh, it was the, the blue dress. And the, yes, it was the blue dress. It was lent by Kenzo, who was a very very good uh, uh, couturier. And uh, they lent me a couple of dresses, but I didn't say it was to put them on a the motorcycle with grease, etc., etc. Et and I was terrified at the idea of putting a stain, a grease stain, on that beautiful dress. <laughs> and besides, uh, always uh, have your arms uh, into sleeves, uh, don't show. Uh, I mean, uh, 
for respect for the the behavior of the people in other countries. Well, and and and, and let me just ask you uh, really quickly about that uh, because you you are your own person your writing is beautiful um and and unfortunately it's not translated into english yet i'm going to say yet in the hopes that it does but for those that can uh you should pick up one of her bo- uh and france's books and who if you do speak french at all it's a, it, they are beautifully written they're humorous you have an uh, uh um a very unique perspective that you bring that sort of encompasses everything who you are but you're very much an individual and very much yourself which is which comes across when we come back i'll be asking Anne france a little bit more about how the french fashion house chloe came to discover her in 2016 more about her around the world trip and what lessons we can learn today stay tuned i'll be right back after these messages <laughs> Welcome back. Let's pick up our conversation now with on fast forward. In 2016, you were actually uh, a muse. Somebody discovered you from the uh, from the runways of Paris, literally the Chloe uh, House of Design, and you became mm-hmm. the muse for for their whole 2016 autumn collection. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? It's, it's really in a little green Martian, which is popping out of your cup of tea in a mad what Murray, you know. <laughs> American uh, uh, cartoon uh, 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 publication. <laughs> really, uh, fashion has been always, always on another planet for me. It is not my thing. Uh, fashion beauty. When I was working in uh, as a as a freelance journalist, things that I couldn't stand. It was incredible that people could spend hours talking about uh, the blue color of uh, the, the little dress, uh, about the red of that lipstick. Jesus, no! Talk to me about a good motorcycle with a good speed in the cylinder, okay? But not that. And suddenly they pop up like this in my life. And uh, as I'm curious, I met them. And uh, we began to talk and I found wonderful people, really Claire White Keller, who is now the designer for Givenchy. You know, she made the dress for the royal wedding in England, wow. that white dress, which is absolutely perfect. She is a great person and we meet uh, sometimes still now. And the people uh, who were around me when we began to make uh, communication about uh, that collection, uh, really they, they became friends. So when you build an idea, sometimes it's good to put it down. <laughs> well, I love the story, and I love the story of what the collection represented, and, uh, and, and, and this is where I wanted to segue to, because you've served as an inspiration. I mean, now there are more than, oh, or as many as, as in North America anyways, I can only quote North American statistics, but 20% of motorcycle riders are women now, which is a very, very large number. That number has almost doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and you, mm-hmm. you were an inspiration for that. What would you say, or what lessons do you think people could learn, or should learn, or relearn? Let me. That's better. Probably better said. What lessons should people relearn today that you experienced from your travels that you would like people to remember? If I could just say one thing, is to take difference as a, like a, how could I say? In my education, you know, I'm uh, 76 now, so I've been educated by people of the 19th century, which a very good will gave me the truth of the 19th century. And uh, 
it was difference uh, is not acceptable. Uh, difference is an accusation. When I began to travel, especially in Afghanistan, I discovered that difference asks you to see what you have in common. It doesn't mean that we are the same, but it means that with different way of life, way of thinking, different way of looking at reality, there is something in ourselves which is very deep and very beautiful, and it is the humanity. So I discovered this uh, on my trip around the world. Uh, when I arrived in India, I always went to the embassy to uh, register me to make sure that if something happened to me, uh, people would know where I am and could come and help. Because you can have a car accident, uh, mostly that thing. And uh, in the embassy, they told me, uh, well, okay, uh, you've been to India, uh, but uh, Afghanistan, you know, by yourself, uh, it's not a very good idea. I said, oh, uh, what are my, my, my odds? What they say, 70-30. Uh, okay, 70, I get through. No, 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 70, you do not get through. So what do I say? Uh, I take a plane ticket and go back uh, to advertisement and... Uh, that uh, story of uh, 11 months and the 12th, uh, no, 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 no way. So we'll see. And in the same time, I knew there was something wrong in, the, in what they told me, but it was not very clear in my head because I had been to those countries uh, the year before and I had felt many things and lived many things which are beautiful. So I start and I say, okay, uh, I go through Pakistan, there are lots of people, so I'm safe usually when there are lots of people. Afghanistan, uh, one day to go to Kabul, another one to Kandahar, the third one to Herat, and after I'm Iran, where there are people again in stress. Arrived to the border of Afghanistan, and there were lots of truckies. Beautiful trucks, you know, they were painted in a pink with a design which is gorgeous. And uh, all the big guys we were driving, the, the, the trucks used to thank me on the shoulder, very brave woman. So uh, now I so thank you, etc. cetera, it's fine. A guy comes and uh, he had no turban, this one, takes me by the hand, leads me to his car, and uh, sh there was a woman with a veil inside of the car and mm. she had a baby in her arms. And this man, I had never seen in my life, he takes the baby and puts it in my arms. Can you imagine we do that for an Afghan? Wow. Putting in his arm the most precious thing of his life. At, I mean, it, it's it's incredible, you know. So, part of my heart exploded. I bet. And then, um, after I finished with the customs, I go on my bike, uh, goodbye, goodbye, and I drive. And between uh, the customs and the Kabul, it's uh, very empty. There is just uh, one... Uh, one city, which is Kazni, mm -hmm. uh, not Jalalabad, pardon. And uh, I drive. And in the middle of nowhere, suddenly, boom, my front wheel has a puncture. So I stopped, parked the motorcycle, began to undo my tire. First, the uh, truck arrives, and the guy on the, on the wheel says, uh, problem, problem. No, no, it's all right, thank you, go away. Second, same thing, problem, problem, no, 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 all right. And the third one stops, doesn't ask anything, and the three huge guys, turban of the head, of course, mm -hmm. arrive to me, and I say, okay, <laughs> you bet, you lost. <laughs> and uh, the first one, the biggest, takes me with the shoulder, sits me on the ground, stays behind me, to make a shadow between the sun and me to make sure I'm not to I'm not uh, disturbed by the sun, and the two others changed my wheel, and when he's finished, they bang me on the shoulder, very brave woman, and they go away. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and I was like, and I said, my girl, you are a human shit because <laughs> you kept in your in your mind. A part of this idea is that those people, because they have a turban, because they are brown, because they are another part of humanity, they could be savage. You're a human shit. I was really ashamed of me. And I think this was the most important moment of my life because 
I put myself not into only French, Europe, family, etc., but into humanity. And when I got this uh, car accident uh, in uh, in uh, 12, uh, 2012, mm-hmm. eight years ago, uh, I spent, for the first time in my life, I got broken bones. Mm. And uh, I was in a hospital north of Paris, which is called Avicenne, and where all the people who uh, are, um, how do you say, the, the patients and the, the people who cure you come from Middle East, from Maghreb, from Africa, etc. So I was again in, in another humanity with right. colors, different, very different. And there I understood what I had lived during my trips. In fact, we cannot communicate through the language, we cannot communicate through the education, through the culture. We have one of those very deep and very strong communication through the roots of our humanity. And this is really what I learned during my, my trips. And I wonder why I love so much animals, because with animals I communicate through the roots of life. That's so that was my philosophical quarter of an hour. That's a be- that's a beautiful story, and I think that's an important message that we can all remember. Anne France uh, Dauville, merci bien. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, us today and uh, on the show. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I will be putting links to where people can get copies of your book and learn more about you as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Don't go away. We'll be right back with another moment of Chasing the Horizon Moto Moment with none other than Wes Fleming. And we're going to be talking about tariffs and China and motorcycle helmets. So stay tuned. <laughs> Joining me now is Wes Fleming from uh, the host of Chasing the Horizon podcast. Wes, are you there? I am here, Andrew. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Wes. It's great to see you. Nice to, uh, nice to welcome you back on this beautiful Wednesday. What's, uh, what's going on in motorcycle world? Well, you know, today I want to talk about tariffs a, a little bit, um, which can be a politically loaded target. Uh, or topic, excuse me, depending, especially depending on what country you're in. But uh, as much stuff has been going on with the pandemic and its effects on the economy, one of the things that hasn't changed is the existence of the trade war, for lack of a better term, between the United States and China. Uh, It started with some uh, tariffs that the United States imposed on steel and aluminum, and it kind of escalated from there back and forth, back and forth. Um, And there have been two groups, the AMA and the MIC, the Motorcycle Industry Council, who have been trying to keep motorcycles, motorcycle parts, uh, various motorcycle related things off of those tariff schedules. Um, So we just got a little bit of news about one specific thing, which is motorcycle helmets. So those have been removed from the tariff schedule from basically the middle of uh, last week through the 1st of September, um, which is a kind of interesting in, in a couple of aspects. Um, number one is that not everything that goes on the tariff list stays on the tariff list. There are um, companies, trade organizations like the MIC and AMA, uh, special interest groups is what we would call them in political circles with lobbyists. And a lot of times when we say those things, they're dirty words. But in this case, you know, the MIC is looking out for us. So we, we like those kinds of lobbyists. 
uh, they're working really hard to um, help keep costs down for motorcycle riders uh, across the United States. Uh, I know you're in Canada um, and thus, you know, not in a trade war with China. Um, yeah. But it's affecting trade between the United States and Canada as well. Um, what a lot of people, uh, and there's some controversy over it, a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, if I buy a helmet from China, I pay the extra money unless the people who sell the helmet absorb that tariff cost. Mm. So a helmet that might have cost $100 a year ago now costs $110 or whatever. Um, and I'm the one that pays that. So it's really nice for for the helmets, especially because we all like our protective gear to come off of that list. The other interesting thing that uh, I wanted to kind of bring up about that is mm -hmm. just how many helmets are made in China. Now, made in China may be a positive or negative thing, depending on your personal background, your personal biases, whatever. But so many things are made in China these days that it's just an astounding number of everyday products that we might buy that are made in China or made with parts from China. Helmets are not uh, unique in that regard. And there are dozens of, you know, kind of no name or small brand mm -hmm. uh, helmets that are, are, are made. And we get thousands and thousands of these helmets into the United States every year. So, uh, I just find it really interesting and you'd be surprised sometimes to know some of the big name brands who either all of their helmets are made in China or a significant number of their helmets are made in China. Usually uh, you can kind of gauge any helmet that looks like it should cost a lot more than it does, probably made in China. Mm -hmm. uh, a helmet that costs less than $200, probably made in China. Uh, quality whether you like the, like it or not is is entirely up to you but um mm. you know it's still china is one of those places where manufacturing costs are still very low mm -hmm. so a lot of manufacturers for a lot of things look to china for that manufacturing power and now uh, the prices reflect it you know you get an $800 helmet is probably not made in china but that $100 helmet i'd almost bet is but a large percentage of the brands are still manufacturing in China right now, right? Not just helmets, but across across the motorcycling industry. Yeah, China has always had tariffs on outside products uh, because that's one of the ways that they maintain their economy and also boost homegrown manufacturing. So to get around what are often very steep tariffs, um, a lot of motorcycle manufacturers will set up production in China and then those... Uh, motorcycles that are made in China are either sold in China or they're exported to other places in Asia, which may get them around other uh, tariffs. Yeah, right. And we see that in India as well. India has pretty high tariffs on, on fully assembled imported motorcycles. So you can either uh, ship in boxes of parts and have uh, Indian factories assemble the motorcycles, which then cuts your tariffs, you know, down to a certain point, mm -hmm. or you can just have an Indian company make your motorcycles in India, and then there's no tariffs. Um, so that's what we're seeing. Uh, BMW, KTM, Triumph, uh, even Ducati is uh, making a small number of motorcycles in China so that People can buy a, a Triumph motorcycle in China and not have to pay a 60 or 80 or 100% tax on it. Duties on it, yeah. Well, kudos to the Motorcycle Industry Council for doing what they're doing. That, that, that's great news. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who do you have coming up on your show next week? Uh, next week is going to be a guy called Ed Staggs. Uh, probably not a real common name in the industry, but he runs a company called Bone Body Armor, and they make a, a basically armored shirts and pants that you can wear under uh, regular clothes, basically, or oh. other under other motorcycle gear um, that might not have armor in it to protect yourself. Uh, and they make all sorts of different products. So it's, it'll, it was a really interesting conversation. He's a, a real interesting dude. Cool guest. Well, folks, make sure you download and listen to uh, Chasing the Horizon podcast. By far the best podcast out there out, uh, on the market. Wes, Thank thanks you. very much for joining us, okay? We'll talk to you yeah. soon. Yeah, anytime. Cheers.
So, that concludes another edition of Bedtime Stories with the Moteller Cyclist. And uh, I am so pleased that you were able to spend the time in joining us. And as you can see, now it's Puppy's turn to say goodnight, too. Victoria, do you want to turn around and say goodnight? No, she doesn't. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and tuning in. We'll see you next week on another edition of Bedtime Stories with the Moteller Cyclist. Yeah.